Today on BRS TV's How To's, we're going to show you how to set up and tune a calcium reactor using the Skim CM152. Hi, I'm Ryan, host of BRS TV, where each week we release a new reefing how to. This week we're going to show you how to set up and tune this Skim's calcium reactor. Calcium reactors are really popular with advanced reefers because they're capable of adding large volumes of calcium and alkalinity. They also dose trace elements, they have no effect on salinity, and they just look cool. I also think a lot of people like the fact that you're melting old coral skeleton to create natural elements for the corals growing within the tank. First step is to unbox it and locate all the components, including the main body, circulating pump, return assembly, bubble counter, secondary media chamber, tubing, and a small bag of plumbing. There's also some additional equipment you need that doesn't come with the reactor, a CO2 tank, a CO2 regulator with a solenoid, a Murloc check valve, feed pump, the feed pump connections, a couple bags of calcium media reactor media, and possibly a magnesium additive, as well as a pH controller. Next, we're going to unscrew the bottom union from the reactor and attach our pump locate the small parts bag that came with the reactor and insert the two seals that came with it. Once the pump is attached, follow by attaching the return assembly. Loosely attach the union, then the pump, and then tighten all three connections. Now loosen the series of thumb screws on the reactor and remove the lid. Note that it comes inverted for shipping and will need to be flipped over when we reinstall it. We're then going to add the media, but we'll want to rinse off all the dusty fines first. Tap water is just fine, but you could use RODI water if you wanted. There are a lot of medias you could use out there, and they all have advantages. I'm using reborn media from Two Little Fishes because this type of media most closely resembles natural coral, and the size and shape has good flow properties. Another one I frequently use is LOCA Pure, which is a purified synthetic form of calcium carbonate, which doesn't contain phosphate like all the natural medias do, but presumably it also doesn't contain trace elements as well. Another one of life's trade-offs. Once the media is rinsed, just add it to the reactor. You don't need to fill it entirely, just a couple inches below the intake pipe. You also want to install the elbow from the parts bag sideways, which will help keep the loose media from entering the intake and pump. I mentioned earlier that you could also use a magnesium media if desired, which is typically a relatively pure source of dolomite like Zeomag or Fonamarin Ultramag. I don't think either one has a major advantage over the other. This is just an easy way to add magnesium as well. If you do elect to use this type of media, just mix the two medias together so the mix contains about 90% calcium reactor media and 10% magnesium media. Next, we're going to replace the calcium reactor's lid. We'll make sure the seal area is free of any loose chunks of media so the O-ring can get a proper seal. Replace all the thumb screws. When it comes time to add more media in a couple of months, you can either remove the screws again or open the union on the top and add media through the provided port. Next, build a secondary media chamber with additional calcium media. This chamber is designed to scrub off any excess carbon dioxide and raise the effluent's pH a bit. There are four ways to feed a calcium reactor, a peristaltic dosing pump, gravity fed, manifold off your main pump, or just get a separate feed pump. Unless you have an expensive, fancy peristaltic pump which allows you to adjust the flow rate, I wouldn't recommend using one of these. Gravity fed is also a pain to regulate, not a long-term solution in my opinion. Manifolding off your main pump is absolutely an option, but sometimes it isn't worth the time or expense of the required plumbing parts. For this install, we're going to use a separate feed pump because it's the easiest, in my opinion, the most reliable option. The manufacturer's instructions recommends a 500 to 1,000 liter an hour pump, which is around 130 to 260 gallons. I selected the CJ Synchro 0.5 because it's right in the middle at 185 gallons. In my opinion, CJ makes the most reliable and quiet submersible pumps out there. The CJ pumps also have a nice half inch female threaded port. It does have an insert in there, so it doesn't allow you to fit in absolutely every fitting, but it does fit most nipples, and it does fit this nice Kynar fitting that we have, which is half inch MPT by quarter inch barb. We'll then use this 3 16 OD one quarter inch ID tubing, as well as a quarter inch RO stem adapter to fit it to the calcium reactor and feed it. Once that's done, we just need to attach a CO2 regulator to the tank. If you want a shiny new one like this, you can pick one up from us, which will come empty, and you can get it refilled at most paintball, welding, or home brewing shops. If you don't care if it's shiny or not, I just go to one of these places and get a used one and swap them out as needed. Kind of like a propane tank for your gas grill. 
Next, attach the quarter inch tubing to the solenoid on the regulator and then to the bubble counter on the reactor. Make sure to use a rigid tubing and clip it somewhere in the middle to attach your Murloc check valve with the arrow pointing towards the reactor. This valve will allow the CO2 to exit the tank but prevent salt water from entering the solenoid, regulator, or tank. This is particularly important when the CO2 tank becomes empty and there's no pressure preventing the water from entering the tank. Now attach the tubing from the other side of the bubble counter to one side of the T located on the top of the reactor. The other side of the T should be connected to the port on the side of the return assembly. This T on top helps recapture and recycle any excess CO2 which can collect at the top of the reactor. The next piece of tubing goes from the straight fitting at the top of the reactor to the bottom of the secondary reactor. And the last piece of tubing goes from the top of the secondary reactor to your tank. And this is where we're going to install the small valve from the parts bag. The only installation step left is to install the optional pH probe. The instructions and other reefers will say pH control is optional, but I believe accuracy and redundancy is the backbone of a successful reef tank, so I wouldn't even consider running a reactor without pH control. It will become more obvious why as I explain how to tune the reactor in just a minute. The probe is pretty simple to install. Just unscrew the compression fitting, remove the plug, insert the probe, and re-tighten the compression fitting. The reactor is now ready to be filled with water, so you can turn on your CHA feed pump, open up the intake valve wide open, as well as the micro valve. Once the water has filled the reactor completely, you can close the outlet valve and turn on the recirculation pump for 5 to 10 minutes or until the water inside runs clear. At this point, reopen the micro valve slightly so you just get one drip a second. Next, we need to set the CO2 intake of the reactor. The bubble counter should have filled on its own with water, but if it didn't, you can remove the check valve for a second and it will. We're using a Milwaukee regulator, which has two pressure gauges and its own bubble counter, if you wanted to use that one. We're just going to focus on the bubble counter that's on the skims reactor because your regulator might not have one of those. There are two gauges on the regulator here, one that reads the pressure inside the tank and one that reads the pressure the regulator is going to emit. Every brand of regulator has a different way to adjust this, but the Milwaukee has a super easy to use knob on the front which allows you to adjust the output pressure. We're going to set it at 15 psi according to the skims instructions. Now adjust the bubble rate using the included needle valve here so we get one bubble a second and we're ready to start dosing calcium and alkalinity with our new reactor and the next step is to tune the reactor to our tank's actual consumption. To melt the media inside the reactor, the pH needs to be between 6.6 .6 and 7.0. Some medias may have their own range, so make sure to read the instructions on the packaging of your media. If the pH in the reactor is too high, the media won't dissolve properly. If it's much lower than 6.6, .6, the media might melt and turn to mush. The pH is going to be a function of the flow rate and the amount of CO2 added to the reactor. If you're not using a pH controller, you'd have to use a pH meter or test kit to measure the effluent of the reactor to make sure it's in the right range. If you're an advanced reefer, feel free to try that, but if you're watching this video, I strongly suggest using a pH controller to regulate the pH within the reactor. We're going to use this Milwaukee pH controller so it'll be a lot easier. This standalone controller is the easiest solution, but you could also use a Digital Aquatics Reef Keeper or Neptune Apex Aquarium controller as well. If you're already in the market for a controller like this, it might be a good time to justify the purchase. So what we're going to do is plug in the solenoid from the regulator into our pH controller so it shuts off the supply of CO2 if the pH ever gets below 6.5. The solenoid will reopen once the pH rises again, which will allow additional CO2 into the reactor and regulate the pH in the range that we set on the controller. I'd also like to set the bubble rate so it won't naturally go much lower than the 6.6 .6 on its own. So the goal here is to get the calcium reactor to emit close to the same amount of calcium and carbon ions as the tank is consuming, and the only way to figure that out is to test. So we have it set to one drip a second, which is likely safe for most tanks, but you'll want to monitor your tank's parameters, including pH, alkalinity, and calcium for the first few days. Well, the manufacturer suggests one drip a second or 60 drips a minute emitted to the tank and one bubble or 60 bubbles a minute of CO2. I suggest beginners start much lower, like 30 drips a second and only 10 bubbles a minute and get a feel for how this all works. Once you get it stabilized and start dosing to the tank, you'll adjust the amount of calcium and alkalinity added to the tank by adjusting the flow rate of the effluent dripped into the tank. If the calcium and alkalinity levels are dropping, increase the drip rate of the effluent to the tank. If they're rising, reduce the flow rate. It shouldn't take that long to adjust to your tank's needs. 
During this time, many people will elect to test for alkalinity rather than calcium on a daily basis because they should be dosed and consumed in equal amounts. And alkalinity changes much faster, so it's easier to detect and adjust for. This might also be a good time to invest in a HANA alkalinity checker because you can get digital results in seconds, and it's a lot easier than doing titration-based tests. One thing you need to keep in mind, however, is when you increase the flow rate within the reactor and the effluent emitted to the tank, it's likely you also need to increase the CO2 bubble count as well. There's a direct correlation between the amount of water flowing through the reactor, the CO2 added to the reactor, and the pH within the reactor. So if I increase the drip rate from 30 to 45 drips a minute, I'll likely need to increase the CO2 bubble rate as well to keep the pH in the reactor in the proper range. You should also note that the pH of the effluent is lower than the tank, and it will drop the pH of the tank slightly, so it isn't uncommon for tanks with calcium reactors to operate much closer to 7.8, which is in the lower range of common reef tank parameters. Calcium reactors are also best at maintaining levels and not raising them initially, meaning I should use a reactor to keep my levels stable. It isn't wise to try and use a reactor to try and raise or adjust levels because you're just going to end up tinkering with it forever as you try to dial it in up and down. To get the calcium and alkalinity levels right to begin with, I'd use a common two-part additive, or my personal preference is just a jug of calcium chloride for calcium and sodium bicarbonate for alkalinity. I suggest sodium bicarbonate over soda ash for adjustments like this because you can add a lot more without having as big of an impact on pH, which makes it safer for larger adjustments. We also have a super easy to use calculator on our site which will tell you how much of each to use. So these easy to use additives get the parameters where you want them and then the calcium reactor is used to keep them there. The last piece of all this is just make sure to follow the manufacturer's recommendations on sizing because it's based on contact time and volume of media in the reactor. It's important that you don't undersize it and let you know you have a pretty low volume tank. If you have any questions or experience of your own with calcium reactors, share them in the comments area down below. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button because we release new videos like this every Tuesday and Friday. See you next week with another episode of BRS TV.